Hi, in this tutorial, I am going to show you how to create a scene of a monster emerging from the sea. Besides this video tutorial, on the official help page of Phoenix, there is a written tutorial called Whale Jump, which is related to this topic. You can also check out that step-by-step -step tutorial to gain important and comprehensive knowledge. And those are the topics I'm going to cover in this video. And I used specific software to create this scene. If you like to follow along, you can download the scene linked in the video description below. Now, let's get started. First, let's talk about the sea monster. Our main character is a giant crab, standing at an impressive height of 30 meters and with a width of around 60 meters. Both the ship and crab geometry are highly optimized. They are solid, watertight models with no errors when the STL check modifier is applied. Additionally, the crab has been unwrapped for texture mapping. We have also created a set of bones and skinned the crab for character animation. And we have set up an IK limb solver for each leg, which makes animation setup much easier. To hide the bones, you can go to the display panel of 3DS Max. In the Hide by Category rollout, enable the Bone Objects option to hide them all, so the bones won't interrupt our fluid simulation. As for the camera, to capture this maritime spectacle, we set up a telephoto camera with motion blur enabled for smoother particle rendering. Additionally, we created a dummy and applied a noise controller to it, linking the camera target to the dummy to achieve a handheld camera effect. That's our scene assets. Now, let's focus on the fluid simulation. First, make sure our system unit is set to meters. Then go to the Create panel, Create, Geometry, Phoenix FEED and create a liquid simulator in the scene. To speed up iterations, the simulation grid does not need to cover the entire area of the monster at this stage. Here, we position the grid to the side, covering only half of the crab. Its precise position is XYZ, 0, 7.3, 11.9. Once the position is determined, the first step is to find the appropriate voxel size for the simulator. Based on our experience from the whale jump tutorial, 0.069 meters is the optimal value. However, considering the size of the crab and the distance of the camera from the main character, we can use a larger voxel size to achieve the desired look. Click the Decrease Resolution button on the simulator twice. We choose our voxel size to be 0.108 meters. The next crucial parameter to determine is the initial fill. Because this tutorial is about a monster emerging from the sea, things happening underwater are not visible, unlike the whale jump scene. Therefore, the value for initial fill does not need to be too high. However, on the other hand, the water cannot be too shallow either, or else the ship won't be able to sail on the sea. As shown in the diagram, we've left some space from the ship's bottom to the sea floor. Additionally, we ensure that the grid height is sufficiently above sea level to accommodate the water brought up by the sea monster when emerging. It must be high enough, otherwise, the water might be cropped at the top boundary of the simulator. In the end, we decided to set the grid size for the XYZ to 357, 246, 169, and set the initial fill at 12%. And for aesthetic purposes, in the dynamics rollout of the simulator, slightly decrease the time scale to 0.9. All set. We can now begin the first simulation. Press the Start button to begin the simulation. After it's done, go to the preview rollout of the simulator, check Show Mesh, and turn off the liquid particle preview. In the rendering rollout, set the mode to Ocean Mesh. By doing so, Phoenix will prompt and ask you, it's strongly recommended to use V-Ray static geometry when rendering infinite ocean. Would you like to enable it? Click Yes. Then set the ocean level percent to the same value as the initial fill, which is 12%. Then go to 3DS Max's drop-down menu, Tools, Preview, Grab Preview, Create Preview Animation. Here are the results, looking good. As you can see, no liquid mesh is cropped at the top, indicating that the simulator's height is sufficient. Next, let's start to work on the splash and mist particles. Select the simulator, 
go to the Splash and Mist rollout and enable the Splash Mist option. Phoenix will prompt asking if you'd like a Phoenix particle shader generated for the Splash particles. Select Yes. This automatically sets up the link between the Splash particles group, the particle shader, and the liquid simulator. To keep everything organized, rename the new particle shader to Particle Shader Splash. Before running the simulation, let's change the preview color of particles. With the simulator selected, in the preview rollout, enable Particle Preview. Set the splash to blue color, mist to red color, and foam to green color. This way, we can easily distinguish between different types of particles in the preview. Now run the simulation. Here's a preview of the simulation results. Since Phoenix will generate splashes in mist, we should monitor the particle count in the cache file content window to ensure there aren't too many particles. We need enough particles to make the shot convincing. However, on the other hand, too many particles mean longer rendering times. As you can see, the amount of mist is excessively high compared to the number of splashes. Since mist particles will render in fog mode and are not the primary visual focus, too much of mist will unnecessarily extend the rendering time. We can reduce the number of mist particles in a simulation and increase their density in the shader to compensate for the reduced quantity. Therefore, we should reduce the number of mist particles in the next step. So, let's go to the splash mist rollout of the simulator and reduce the mist amount to 0.1. To add more interest to the shot, Let's incorporate a wind force into the scene. Go to the Create panel, Helpers, Phoenix FD, and create a plane force as a wind. Position and rotate it like so in the scene. Set the strength to 5 meters. This value is sufficient to push splash, mist, and foam particles without being excessively strong. Since we only want the wind to affect splash, mist, and foam, Ensure to set it to affect only those particles, removing others from the list. Tick the Apply Force Behind Icon option. With the updated settings and the plane force in the scene, press Start to run the simulation. Here's a preview of the results. We begin to see the wind pushing splash and mist to the right, and the mist amount maintains at a lower value. So, the default value for splash to mist is 0.1, which yields decent results. However, we would like to increase the value of the splash to mist parameter. Considering the values of splash air drag as 1 and mist air drag as 2, increasing splash to mist also alters the overall shape of the splash. Additionally, increasing this value means more splash particles will convert to mist. Overall, we can achieve a more optimal number of particles in the scene. Therefore, we set the splash to mist value to 0.5. With the new splash to mist settings, let's run the simulation. And here is the preview. Now that we are satisfied with the general shape of our splash, let's enhance the simulation further. With the simulator selected, go to the splash and mist rollout. Increase the splash amount to 3000. Correspondingly, Further decrease the mist amount to 0.004 to avoid excessive mist. Please note that a larger splash amount decreases the size of splash particles, making them less grainy in the rendering. To improve the blending of the splash particles with the liquid mass, go to the dynamic section of the splash mist rollout of the simulator and increase the liquid-like value to 50. With the new settings, let's now run the simulation. Here are the results. I like the overall appearance of my splashes and mist. Now, to further enhance the shot, let's enable the Simulate Air Effects option in the Dynamics rollout of the simulator. This option can significantly improve the quality of splash and mist effects by allowing Phoenix to simulate air in areas of the grid with no liquid. Run the simulation, and here's the preview. Now everything looks good. However, when the monster emerges from the sea, we need more detail. Particularly, I would like to have more dripping from the crab. So let's create a liquid source and manually paint the areas where we want more particles to achieve the desired look. Go to the Create panel, Helpers, Phoenix FD, and create a liquid source in the scene.
Rename it to Liquid Source Foam Splash. Then, use the Add button to include the crab geometry in the emitter nodes list. This will turn the crab into a source of liquid or particle emission. Please note that even though this helper is named Liquid Source, we don't intend to use it to emit liquid because simply emitting liquid won't provide enough visual details. So, we disable the Emit Liquid option, and we want to use this helper to emit splash and foam particles to achieve the desired look. All right, by default, the particles will emit from the entire surface of the crab, but instead of having homogeneous emission, we would like to control which specific areas emit particles. With the crab geometry selected, apply a vertex paint modifier to the crab. Once applied, the Vertex Paint toolbar appears. Switch the shading mode to Vertex Color Display Shaded. This allows you to see the vertex color on the surface of the crab in the viewport. Change the color swatch to black and fill the crab with black color using the bucket tool. Black means no emission, while white means emission of particles. Now that the base color of the crab is set, we can begin painting in white to define where particles should be emitted from. Change the color swatch to white. Use the Paint tool. Adjust the size to 1 meter and start painting the crab. And here is my finished painting. The vertex color only provides a rough approximation of the area for particle emission. To make the mask more organic, in the Material Editor, create a V-Ray Comp Texture. In Source A, create a noise map. Set the noise type to fractal, size to 0.7, and noise threshold low to 0.6. To make the emission more interesting and not always from the same spot, in the track view, curve editor, animate the phase of the noise map. Set the value to 0 at frame 0 and 5 at frame 150. Then, in Source B of the V-Ray Comp Texture, create a Vertex Color Texture. Set its subchannel to one of the colors. Here, we choose Red. Set the operator of the V-Ray Comp Texture to Multiplier. Place this composite map into the outgoing velocity and the foam mask slots. Please note that we temporarily enabled the foam particle in the source just for placing the map for masking. We leave it disabled for now and will enable it in later steps. For the splash mask slot, only place the noise map that we just created. Make sure to set all the mask types to Texture Map and set the noise to 1.0 to introduce some randomness into the emission. Please note that the method of masking the emission involves artistic decision-making, and there is no singular, correct approach. Feel free to customize the maps according to your preferences. To make the emission more convincing, we can animate the outgoing velocity of the liquid source based on the sea monster's movement, so that the emission from the liquid source matches the timing of the sea monster's actions. Select the liquid source in the Graph Editors, Track View, Curve Editor. Set keyframes for the outgoing velocity. It begins with 0 at frame 35 and reaches the maximum value of 7 at frame 76 then gradually decreases to zero at frame 109. In our previous experience with the whale jump scene, 
A value of 400 for the splash particles seemed to work well for a liquid source, so let's set it to 400 in the liquid source. With the new liquid source in the scene, let's simulate again. Here is the preview of the results. We can see that when the monster emerges, there are more details, such as more particles dripping from the head. Next, let's focus on the foam. Go to the foam rollout of the simulator and enable the foam option. A pop-up window will prompt and ask us to create a particle shader for the foam, so select Yes. Rename the new particle shader to Particle Shader Foam. Select the simulator and navigate to the foam rollout. Lower the birth threshold of the foam to 5 meters because the default threshold is not low enough to trigger foam generation in this case. Then, decrease the foam amount to 0.5 accordingly to prevent excessive foam. Decrease the foam size to 0 0.006 meters. This size is from the whale jump scene and is carefully chosen to achieve a visible foam appearance at camera distance without appearing overly grainy. It might not be the optimal size for this scene, but we can further adjust the perceived foam size in the particle shader by tweaking the size multiplier after the simulation is complete. Now, with foam enabled, let's run the simulation. Here is the preview of the results. You can see some foam acting strangely, flying upward at a very high speed. Let's adjust some parameters to make the foam look better. With the simulator selected, go to the Dynamics section of the foam rollout. Decrease the foam volume to 50. Foam volume regulates interactions within foam particles, ensuring they maintain their volume. A higher value means longer calculation time, so we decrease it by half. Reduce the rising speed to 0.3 meter and decrease the falling speed to 25 meters. These settings ensure that foam motion appears natural both underwater and above water. Next, in the pattern section, set the formation speed to 0.5 and the radius to 1.6 meters. The formation speed controls how quickly foam patterns form. By giving it a low value, the pattern won't form too quickly, creating a more natural appearance and the radius represents the average foam radius of a single circular pattern core. A radius of 1.6 meters is based on a real photo of a ship in the sea, so you can get a believable foam pattern size from the simulation. To make the shot more interesting, in the splash mist rollout of the simulator, let's enable the foam on hit option and set it to one, and set the minimum age to 0.1. The minimum age ensures that only splash particles with a particle age above this limit produce foam when they hit the liquid surface. Furthermore, let's enable the foam particle emission of the liquid source we created previously and set it to a value of 30,000. This amount is based on our experience with the whale jump scene. With these new settings, let's run the simulation again and see what we got. And here is the preview. To further enhance the realism of the simulation, let's incorporate another force, Phoenix Turbulence. Go to the Create panel, Helpers Phoenix FD, and create a Phoenix Turbulence in the scene. Set its strength to 100 and its size to 10 meters. These values are well suited for this scene, as they can achieve the desired force pattern without being too strong. In the Affect list, remove the other particles, leaving only mist and foam. We include mist and foam in the Affect list because our intention is to disrupt only these two particle types. With the Phoenix Turbulence in the scene, let's run the simulation again and see what we got. This is the preview. Now, we're basically all set for the fluid and particle simulation settings. For the final simulation, let's reposition the simulator to cover both sides of the crab and increase its grid size to encompass a larger area. Its precise position is at XYZ, 0, 0, 11.9. And the final grid size for XYZ is 357, 590, 
169. Until now, the ship animation has relied purely on keyframes. So next, our goal is to simulate the ship with an active body so that there are interactions between the liquid and the ship, making the shot more convincing. From the Create panel, Phoenix FD, Active Bodies, create an Active Bodies helper in the scene. In the interaction rollout of the Active Bodies helper, use the Add button to add the ship geometry to the Include list. By doing so, Phoenix will create a center of mass gizmo in the scene for you and the gizmo's position based on the ship's pivot. Please note that we've fine-tuned the pivot position beforehand to ensure the ship maintains balance while sailing. The position of the center of mass is very critical. An incorrect position can cause the ship to capsize. If you wish, you can also manually adjust the position of the center of mass gizmo. Another important parameter to keep the ship afloat is density. With the ship selected, right-click, Phoenix Properties. Here you can set the density of the ship. We've given it a value of 300, which is the optimal value in this case. For more details, please check our Active Bodies Guide on the Help page where you can see information on how to set up active bodies for a ship. So far, the settings have only kept the ship afloat. They cannot make it move forward. Let's create another helper object in the scene. Go to the Create panel, Helpers, Phoenix FD, click on the AB thruster, and create an active body thruster in the scene. Position it behind the ship underwater as it were a propeller, and ensure that the helper aligns with the ship's central axis. With the thruster helper selected, add the ship to the affected body. Set both the magnitude and initial velocity to 1.5 meters. Those settings for the thruster are sufficient to push the ship forward and make it sail with some speed right from the very beginning. After creating the active bodies and the thruster helper, go to the simulator. At the bottom of the dynamics rollout, enable the active bodies option and then add the active body helper we just created to the simulator. All right, with the larger simulator, the active body for the ship and a thruster helper, Let's run the final simulation. Once the simulation is complete, before generating the preview animation, let's add more detail to the ocean mesh. With the simulator selected, go to the rendering rollout and enable the displacement option. Plug a Phoenix FD ocean texture into the map slot, then drag and drop it into the material editor as an instance. In the material editor, Select the Phoenix FD Ocean Texture we just created. To make the ocean more prominent, increase the control by wind speed to 6 meters and the level of detail to 20. The velocity coherence determines wave direction variation. A value of 1 result in uniform waves, while a value of 0 creates randomly moving waves. Here, we chose an intermediate value of 0.4 for the velocity coherence. To make the waves move towards our camera, Adjust the Z angle of the ocean texture to 180. OK, we're all set. Let's generate a preview animation to see the final results. You may notice that when the sea monster emerges, the ship shakes subtly. Now we can proceed to the shading and rendering part. Before we start working on the shader and material, let's create the particle shader for the mist. Go to the Create panel, Phoenix FD, and press the Phoenix Foam button to generate a new particle shader in the scene. Rename it to Particle Shader Mist. Press the Add button and choose the Liquid Simulator. When you do this, a pop-up window will prompt you to add Phoenix FD Liquid in the Liquid Simulator slot of the shader. Select Yes. Then select the Mist Particle group. Switch the Particle Shader mode to Fog. Leave everything as default. We will adjust them later. Now we have a total of three particle shaders in the scene for the foam, splash, and mist. Okay, now let's set up the material for the water. Create a V-Ray material in the material editor. Change the diffuse to black. Set both the reflection and refraction colors to white. 
enable the reflect on backside option for a more realistic reflection. Now it's basically a water material, but since we want ocean shading, we need to set up translucency to convey depth. Let's switch the translucency to volumetric. Set the fog color to a bluish gray color. Since the height of the grid is 18,328 centimeters and the initial fill is 12%, let's give the depth a value of 2,000 centimeter as a reasonable value. Switch the illumination to directional. This method tends to propagate more light in the direction from which the surface is lit. Set the scatter color to light blue. Set SSS amount to 0.5. This parameter blends diffuse color with subsurface scattering effect, reducing diffuse component. Apply this material to the simulator. Additionally, we have placed a V-ray plane at the grid bottom as the ocean floor and set its object color to black. You can also change the color according to your preference. Finally, we are ready for our first rendering. We have set up a V-ray sun and sky system in the scene. We positioned the V-ray sun to cast light from behind, enhancing the menacing presence of the giant creature. To prevent fireflies in the water reflections, we enabled the invisible option for the sun. As a representative frame for the entire animation, go to frame 90 and perform a quick render of the current scene. This is the rendered image. As you can see, because we are rendering water splashes, foam, and mist all together, it becomes challenging to discern the contribution of each particle type to the final image. Therefore, to isolate the impact of each particle type on the image, use the eye icon within the Select by Name window to temporarily hide all three particle shaders. This prevents V-Ray from rendering them. And then, unhide them one by one and render the image out to observe their individual effects. So, this is the image rendered with foam only. You can see we need more foam in the rendering. And this is the image rendered with splash only. The splashes are too grainy. And this is the image with mist particles only. We can barely see the mist in the image. Okay, before addressing these issues, let's first color correct our image in the frame buffer. So, unhide all three particle shaders in the scene and render again. Then, in the V-Ray frame buffer, use the Create Layer icon to add layers for exposure, white balance, and filmic tone map. This is the rendered image after color correction. You can see that the exposure layer adjusts exposure slightly, the white balance layer corrects the color of the ocean, and the filmic tone map layer simulates film response, making the image less overexposed and more visually appealing. Additionally, the lens effect layer allows us to add bloom and glare to the image. These are my final settings for color correction in the frame buffer. All right, it's time to fine tune the particle shaders for foam, splash, and mist. Now, let's focus on the foam. Since the foam size is small, let's increase the size multiplier to 2.5 and set the size variation to 0.5 for a more organic appearance. Also, let's increase the count multiplier to 3. With only the foam particle shader unhidden, render out the image and see the improvement. Now, let's unhide only the particle shader splash in the scene. Since the splash particles are too big, we decrease the size multiplier to 0.3. To maintain the volume of the splash, we increase the count multiplier. The formula for maintaining the volume for the count multiplier is the inverse of the size multiplier raised to the power of 3. In this case, since the size multiplier is set to 0.3, it results in a value of around 37 for the count multiplier. However, we need to consider the rendering performance when using such a high count multiplier. I found that a value of 5 for the count multiplier suffices for the visual. Then, set the motion blur to force on 
and increase the motion blur multiplier to 2. This will smear the splash particles in the rendering and make it more visually appealing. Render the image and see if it looks better. Now we have the splashes in the proper size. Lastly, unhide the particle shader mist in the scene. In the fog rollout of the particle shader, Decrease the voxel size to 0.1 and increase the fog density to 1. These changes ensure that the mist particles appear in proper size and are more visible in the rendering. To enhance the realism of the mist, we adjust the absorption color to a grayish green color. It's important to note that the perceived color in the rendering will be the complementary color to this color, that is light blue color. In order to make the phase function work, we switch the scattering to ray traced. The default value for the phase function is zero. Let's give it some value, such as 0 0.7. Positive values correspond to forward scattering, which mimics water droplets where light scatters more. Our scene's backlight setup is also well suited for the performance of forward scattering. Then, set the motion blur to force on and increase the motion blur multiplier to four so that we get smeared mist that looks more visually pleasing. Render the image. Now you can see mist particles with a slight blue tint. To render all three types of particles in the scene, let's unhide all three particle shaders and run another rendering. Here is the rendered image. Very good. I really like what we got. All right, we are almost ready for the production rendering. However, there are still some things we need to tweak to ensure the quality of our rendering. First, Go to the rendering rollout of the liquid simulator. Increase ocean subdivisions to 6 to reduce horizon flickering. Assign a value to the off-screen margin, for example, 10. This option extends the ocean further from the borders of the camera view, which is important for motion blur or displacement to appear correctly at the edge of the camera view. For the particles, go to the particle shader mist settings. Disable the volume light cache because enabling this option here might cause GI flickering in mist-rich areas. As for V-Ray, the only change I made is to the max subdivisions for the bucket image sampler. I set it to 10 for the final production render. In this video, we've shared some tips and tricks on how to create the effect of a sea monster emerging from the sea. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and found it useful. See you next time.